We'll make it work. You can't start class earlier. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. I have a little, um, a you, little... You, by the way, you are live, so we should not talk too much. Oh, okay. Okay. Or you can turn off for a second. Can I? Yeah, yeah just flip this. Yeah, that's all good. Whenever you're ready. Whenever Bailey's ready to go. Bailey? Yeah, Bailey is the one that's okay. uh, yeah, she, she knows. Pop. Is everyone in here a GRC major? It's all levels, right? Like all grades? I was like trying to remember and I didn't really remember. So weird being. Are you a student yeah, still? Student, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Cool. So you're just helping coordinate yeah. and organize. Our, I'm in Taga. So oh yeah, yeah. Taga, like, present everybody. Yeah. So. Cool. I love it. I remember being in here. <laughs> it's super. It's super weird being back. Are you guys pretty on time? Have you been yeah. running pretty on time? They've been ending like five or ten minutes early and did like Q and A. That's what I was planning on. Time and then if not, it just kind of yeah. Ends. Yeah. They can like come up here and talk to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Our next speaker is Christina Benzino. Our next speaker is Christina Benvenuto. She is a 2012 graduate from Cal Poly GRC. Christina started her career at Apple following graduation, working as an account manager on the mobile advertising team. Um, Christina left Apple after four years for a digital advertising agency in San Francisco, where she worked as an account director launching integrated advertising campaigns for tech and pharmaceutical companies. 
In 2018, Christina moved to the in-house marketing team at Navita, where she currently works as senior marketing manager, leading consumer <coughs> go-to-market strategies. Outside of work, Christina keeps her passion for creativity alive through freelance projects for family and friends, and enjoys running good music and pretending to be a contestant on a few letters. <laughs> Thank you. That's basically by the first half of my presentation, so I can skip my I can skip the intro that I put together um, for myself. But first of all, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for having me back. Um, I'm really excited to be here. It's it's really nostalgic and kind of weird, honestly, walking through the building and being like, oh, I remember this class and that class and seeing how things have changed around campus. But I'm incredibly honored to to be here and really excited. Um, to share a little bit about my story with you guys. So I hope you learned something. Um, I love questions. I like to make things interactive. So please interrupt me if you feel like it. I did leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and hopefully you guys find this exciting. Um, so like Bailey said, this presentation is, is really kind of where I've taken my um, career since graduating in 2012. Um, I've worked both at an agency, um, a full integrated traditional digital um, advertising agency, and now I'm in-house um, at a larger tech company called NVIDIA. So I want to give you guys a little bit um, of what it's like in, in both of those worlds, working in-house at an agency and, um, or sorry, at an agency and then in-house. Um, this is one of my favorite little pictures. So that's me. Um, I told my mom that I was doing this, obviously. And she's like, oh my god, you've been creative since you were like two. Um, so she said, and then she sent me like 5,000 photos of myself painting. And don't tell your moms ever to like go look for old photos of yourself because it won't ever end. Uh, but I did like this one, and obviously my favorite toys aren't Duplo and Blocks anymore, but I do think it's fun to look back and see, um, even at four, I like to color and paint um, all the time, and it's, it's fun to me that that's continued my entire life and that it's something that I still get to do as part of my career today, so that's, it's just fun. Um, a bit of background about myself, I know that we just kind of went through all of this, but I did graduate in 2012. Um, I did individualized course of study as my concentration, which was writing and design for journalism. That's what I named it. Um, and I can get into a little bit about why I picked that in a second. Um, I was also involved in a couple other things while I was here. I was Gamma Phi Beta. I don't know if there's any G5s in the audience, but um, I was president of that sorority. Uh, when I was a senior, I was also on the Panhellenic board. Um, so I kept myself busy with some other, um, other activities outside of my major. Um, and then Mobius Journal, which actually, I don't know what the status of that is now. I think I read somewhere it's maybe online, but at the time um, it, was a, it was a journal and it was basically, it showcased a bunch of work from the College of Liberal Arts. And um, I was a director of promotion and visibility for Mobius when it was, when it was active, when I was on campus. So um, this kind of all being the VP of Public Relations for Panhellenic Board and helping with promotion and visibility for Mobius got me interested in writing. Um, and that's what kind of led into my concentration being the individualized course of study that I chose at the time. So that's a bit of background of what I did while I was at Cal Poly. Um, but what was fun was when I was putting this presentation together, um, I saved a ton of stuff. And I think it's really important for you guys to do that too. Um, while you're moving through your major, keep, keep a hold of things. You, you do some amazing work in these classes. Um, so this was actually, I think this was from 440. This was the magazine spread that I'd put together uh, my senior year. So it's just really fun going back and seeing some of the stuff that I had done that I still have and still like, I still really like this, you know, and a lot of the people that I put in um, on that left hand side there, they're still my friends. Those are all Cal Poly graduates as well um, in the workforce and, and killing it up in the East Bay. So uh, this was the, I would change some things about this one now, but the open house poster I did obviously back in 2013. Um, and this was the monograph that I put together. So just a couple cool pieces that I'm really proud to still have and hold on to. Um, I would still would put them in portfolios and, and things like that. The one thing that I didn't include um, that I do want to mention is the resume. We took a resume class um, and the, the header and the design of the resume that I put together when I was a senior is still the resume that I use today and it has gotten me every role that I've had ever since. So take that class seriously, use your professor's knowledge, they know what they're doing um, when they're writing a resume, when you're putting together a resume, when you're designing it and outlining it, I can't stress that enough. I use the exact same one um, that I did when I was a senior. So this is my career path. Um, again, this was mentioned a little bit at the beginning of this presentation, but it all started with an internship. So I know there's a career fair at the end of this week. I really encourage you guys to go. Um, that's where everything started for me. So I was an intern at Apple between my junior and senior years here. 
um, in an IAD department. IAD is now known as Search Ads, and I'll talk a little bit about Apple, but the majority of this talk will be more about the agency and NVIDIA. Um, but I started, actually got a full-time offer when I was a senior here at Apple. Um, so I started right after graduation, quickly. I started like a week after I graduated, and I was an account manager and then a global account manager um, on the IAD team. After about four years, I moved to a advertising agency in San Francisco called Havas. Um, they do have offices in New York and in Chicago. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of them, um, but we'll get into a little bit about what Havas does. And most recently, for about a year and a half now, I've been at NVIDIA as a senior marketing manager. So that's kind of been the flow of how everything's gone, but again, really started from an internship. So take advantage of those career fairs and see what you can do while you're here. There's a lot of resources for sure. So we'll start with, um, with Apple. I'll keep this part quick. Um, IAD, like I said, it doesn't exist anymore. It's now called Search Ads, but at the time, it was a mobile advertising platform that basically helped app developers integrate ads into their apps. And you guys probably find them annoying, right? Like you open an app and you're playing a game or you're like on your Facebook and here comes the sponsored ad and here comes the content. And you're like, just get out of the way. I wanna see what I'm here for. That's what I did. Um, and so like I, I knew it was annoying and that's kind of how I led the pitches when I was talking to people. Like we know this is annoying, but it's good brand awareness. Um, so brands themselves get more awareness. App developers obviously got some revenue by people interacting with their ads. Um, and like I wrote at the bottom, it was annoying for, for consumers, I understand that. Um, but it was a win-win for brands. So my role specifically on that team was to work with the app developers. So when I say developer, think like Zynga, um, New York Times, King that develops Candy Crush, any of those big app developers. Um, I'd work with them directly to integrate these ads into their app in a way that looked and felt like it belonged. So these developers spend a lot of time making sure that their app looks good, right? Like they want, if you're using an app, they, they want, they're proud of it, you know? They want it to, to look good and perform well. So if they're putting an ad in it, we wanna help them make sure that it looks the best that it can. Um, so really kind of owning the process of making sure the visual look and feel match their app was my role, and then obviously that they were performing well. So that's what I did when I was at Apple for the first couple of years. Um, the number one question I get asked in any interview is, why would you ever leave Apple? Um, yeah, there were perks. It was, it was a great company to work at. I did meet some of the execs. I did get to go to a lot of these like iTunes band bash things. It was super fun. Um, I did get discounts. There were, there were perks. Um, but ultimately, it, uh, the department that I was in transitioned into more of a sales role. And my passion, like you saw that first slide since I was four and my major here is creative. Um, I wanted to be more involved in a creative process and that's ultimately why I chose to leave Apple for an agency where I knew I'd get a little bit more exposure into that creative side of things. So again, number one question I always get asked, but creative is, is my passion and what I really wanted to follow um, with my career. So that took me to Havas, San Francisco, and I promise this is gonna get more exciting. There is creative and stuff and like showy things at the end of this. This is just like, this is the words for now and then we'll get into the fun stuff. But Havas, San Francisco, um, they call themselves a fully integrated digital traditional advertising agency. So you guys might know this, um, but a digital agency obviously specializes in digital work. So that's websites, that's search engine optimization, that's online ads, that's social media, it's digital. Traditional on the other side is um, <coughs> billboards, it's broadcast, it's direct mailers to your home, it's, it's TV, it's radio, it's basically anything that's traditional advertising. Um, so at Havas, we actually did both of those things. We were fully integrated. Um, so if a client wanted a billboard, they could have that, but they could also have an email campaign at the exact same time. And we did both of those things, which was really neat and gave me exposure to a lot of different things that I never thought that I would have exposure to. And we'll get into that in a minute. My role specifically, I was an account director when I was at Havas, started as a supervisor, um, was really to manage the relationship with the client. Um, and I'll show you guys a little bit about how the flow of communication works within an agency, but everything really comes from the client. So as an account director, my role was to ensure that anything that went out the door, anything that we gave back to the client was in line with their strategic brand objectives, that it was on budget, that it was on time, um, and most importantly, that the relationship itself was there. So you need to have a good client relationship. That's constant communication. That's making sure you're listening. That's making sure you're being honest, open, transparent. Um, because if you have a, a happy client, that's more business coming in your door. So as the account person, my role was to work very closely with our creative team to make sure that everything that left our door was exactly what our client would want 
um, will want it at the, at the beginning of the project kickoff. So I put this little diagram together to kind of show how information flows within an agency. And this is in no way a hierarchy of importance. This is just how the information itself flows through an agency. Um, everything starts with the client. Um, in my case, and I'll show you guys which clients I specifically worked on, Havas San Francisco was focused on technology and healthcare. Um, so that's big pharma advertising, um, which is a beast of its own. But um, the client, basically, whoever they are, will start by briefing the agency with what, what, what their need is. So a client will come to an agency for a problem that they can't solve themselves. Um, and that's, that, that was kind of one of the biggest things that I, that I think about when I think of an agency is somebody somebody's going to hire an agency to solve a problem that they can't solve themselves. Like there's a need that this, that this company can't do, so we're going to bring in an agency to, to fix this, to, to do these emails, to make this website, to perform this creative stunt, whatever it is. The client's going to come and brief the agency on what they need done. Um, and that includes the account manager. So whoever account person or whatever account person is dedicated to that account will all basically sit there and say, okay, this is the problem that we're, we've been brought in to help solve. Then they get into scoping and estimating the cost of work. Um, this is really important because, I don't know, okay, so I think you guys, I think Professor Keefe still shows an email that I sent him about um, how I didn't really love the estimating class when I was here, but it turned out to be the most important class that I ever took here, and I still stand by that. Yes, I, I did send an email after I graduated saying, I'm sorry, I should have taken it more seriously. This is literally saving my job because every single piece of work that comes through a door at an agency needs to be estimated and scoped. Um, Excel will touch every, has touched every single job that I've had um, and knowing and understanding that tool has been absolutely paramount. So um, basically after the client uh, tells you what work they want done, the agency then will go scope and estimate the cost of getting it actually done, right? So that's, okay, do we need this certain type of paper? Do we need these certain type of people? Do we need an entire video production team? Whatever it is, they're gonna bring in all these elements and scope it, take it back to the client, and make sure everyone's good. Assuming all is good, um, then things go to the, the project itself, we'll go to the account and the project manager. Um, again, the account management team was the team that I was on, um, and what we'll do then is take the project details and give them to the creative team. And again, this when I say project, it can be anything. We could be doing an email campaign, we could be doing a website, we could be shooting an entire video, um, we could be putting a billboard up in Times Square, whatever it is, that's when the account manager then takes all this information they've gotten and takes it to the creative team who then ideates and comes up with the ideas, the concepts, um, puts the actual creative together. And these two teams, the account manager and creative team, work very, very closely together again, to make sure that everything is aligning back to those original client brand objectives, if that makes sense. Project manager is also there just to make sure that everything is working and running according to process, that when the account and the creative team are going crazy and saying, hey, this is so fun and we should hire this celebrity to do our commercial and we should do this and we should print 97,000 of these, they're like, hold on, no, no, we estimated this budget, you guys can't do that. So the three kind of, the account manager, project manager, and creative team kind of keep each other in check and then again, the account manager takes everything back to the client um, for reviews, for approvals, um, and really to get things out the door. So that's, that's how the flow of things work at an agency. Um, and there's pros and cons to that. So working in an agency is a lot of variety. Um, there's not a ton of choice around who your clients are. Business is business. There are agencies that specialize in specific types of business. Like I said, Havas San Francisco was specifically tech and healthcare. Um, but you're gonna be working on a variety of different projects. So that's multiple projects, that's multiple clients. Um, it's a great thing because that means you get expertise in a ton of different areas. I worked on um, crusties, which is like pancakes and lemon bars, you know, that you see in the grocery store. But I also worked on Genentech, which manufactures like big pharmaceutical drugs. That, that doesn't get more different. Um, I worked on a campaign, Buck Wild was like a popcorn snack. And I also worked on rare disease. So a lot of, a lot of variety in different business areas, but that's the clients that we had at the time. And that was a business that I was put on. Um, it's a pro for sure, ton of exposure, it was fantastic, but it does, it does also mean that you're managing different clients' needs and goals and expectations, um, and tech is very different than pharma. So it's, it's, it's a lot of multitasking, it's a, a lot of organization for sure, but great exposure. Um, 
to be completely transparent, some projects and work days are less glamorous and that's just the way that it is at an agency. Some days are fantastic. I went to New York a bunch of times. Um, I was on a lot of different video sets, that's super cool. Um, but there were days that we worked until midnight making seven emails that looked exactly the same. And that's, 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 again, it goes back to the variety of working at an agency and the client has brought you in to solve a certain problem and that's a problem that you're going to be solving. Um, so super glamorous sometimes, other times not so glamorous. Um, exposure to all parts of the creative process. This kind of leans into what I was saying just a second ago. You do get exposure into every different part. It's, it's very hands-on, right? It's roll up your sleeves and let's get in and let's figure this out. And um, I'm going to meet with the creative team. And like I keep saying, I've been on video sets. I'm, I'm not a video producer. I don't know how to edit video. Um, but I was on the sets. I was in videos. I was you know, looking over someone's shoulder, being like, how, like, how are you moving these layers around in Photoshop and, and print files and all of this stuff, you're really involved in every single piece of it because you're working super hard together to get things done for the client on time. Um, and that's awesome, it's super fun. Um, but you learn what you like and you don't, right? So if you, if you love that and you love being involved in every single part of the creative process, that's fantastic. Um, but <coughs> sometimes you like to specialize and that might be why you like in-house better and we'll see that in a minute. It's fast paced, it's high pressure, it's a ton of fun. Um, I loved working at, at Havas. Uh, I was there for about four and a half years. It is fast paced and high pressure, again, I would say just because the clients are dictating your deadlines. Um, but it's a ton of fun. You're there late sometimes, um, but you're with a team that cares and they want everything to get out the door and you're proud of your creative and they're proud of their creative. And um, it's, you, you never know, which I think is, is probably the most exciting part about working at an agency, is you don't know what project you're going to get next. Um, and it can be, I mean, I've done, I've done some really cool things I'll show you guys in a minute. Like we, we wrapped, I don't know if you guys know what Caltrain is, it's like, a, it's like BART kind of up in the Bay Area. We wrapped the entire side of Caltrain with a campaign one time and to see that go by every day with creative that we'd put together is so neat, right? Or to see a commercial that came on, comes on TV um, you guys may, might have seen it. It's the one that's like, cut your monthly migraine days in half. Like that, I did that. So that's fun, that's fun to see, you know? Like it's really fun to see that. But um, so basically that, that's what it's like to work in an agency. I would say it's, again, it's fast paced, it's variety. Um, you're rolling your sleeves up, you're getting dirty. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, oh, this is me at midnight one day. I don't know who took this photo, but I have it for some reason and um, I like it because it just kind of reminds me of what it was like to be at the agency where we were, the, it's, the agency that I was at was really, it was, it was designed in a super funky way and it had all these glass walls and you could see through everything and the glass walls were the whiteboards and so we'd write all the notes and we'd brainstorm. So this was after like a super long brainstorm and I think my other team was in the other room and someone had seen me and took this picture and it just kind of like encapsulates like, here's the brainstorm, I'm probably tired, but like we're all still there together and I just like this picture a lot. So I decided to toss it in, I don't know why. Um, the reason I left Havas was because we were acquired by Havas Health and You. Um, and that meant we became entirely pharmaceutical. Um, <coughs> pharmaceutical advertising is very different because basically everything, not basically, everything is regulated by the FDA um, and that makes it extremely hard to be as creative as we wanted to be. Um, it makes sense, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people kind of joke about like, oh, no one's gonna die over this, but with pharma, that's, that can happen. So you need to be very careful, there's extreme regulations around what you advertise. Um, really problem solving, like advertising for pharmaceutical companies was really problem solving because you had to figure out how to get <coughs> consumer messages across in a way that still met these regulatory demands. Um, but I wanted to be able to exercise my, my creativeness a little bit more. Um, so that's ultimately what led me to start looking for a new role after four and a half years, um, which led me to NVIDIA. And that's a company that I'm currently at now. Um, I know it's spelled super weir weird, it's pronounced NVIDIA. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Some have, some haven't. Um, if you're a gamer, I have some Steam gift cards that I can give away that my team is super excited to, to pass out. So if you guys know what Steam is, please come see me, I've got a bunch. Uh, but we are, a, just a quick overview of NVIDIA for those of you who don't know. Um, we invented the graphics processing unit. It's known as, well, most commonly known as the GPU and it's essentially a chip that makes things run faster um, on computer screens. That's the easiest way to explain it. 
we can go super in depth into what it actually does, but it renders images and animations a lot faster on computer screens. So this is really important for video gaming. Um, for I don't personally myself game, but I do work in the gaming industry at NVIDIA. Um, and so these PC gamers, they want no latency. They want games to run as fast and as high you know, as highly animated and, you know, rendered perfectly as it possibly can be in our technology allows the graphics on the computer to do this. Um, same for editing film. And most recently, we've gotten more as a company into like self-driving cars, robotics and things like that. Just the chips that we create are really used in a lot of different places. So that's very high level what NVIDIA itself is. We do also have consumer goods, um, and that is what I specifically work on at NVIDIA. So what you see here is the NVIDIA Shield TV. Um, if you guys aren't familiar, I wasn't when I started. Coming from Apple, it was actually kind of weird because this is the Android version of the Apple TV. So all of a sudden, I had to switch everything over to Android. And I think the hard, actually this is funny, the hardest thing about my new role was that I had to use a PC, um, which was very difficult because I'd used a Mac the entire time I was at Cal Poly and then I worked at Apple and then I was at an agency. And so when they handed me a PC, I didn't know how to like turn it on. And <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. And that was, that was delicious actually. Um, Anyway, so everything all of a sudden switched over to Android, um, and that was that was a learning curve, but beside the point. Essentially what I do at NVIDIA is I manage um, this product called the NVIDIA Shield TV, and then also our gaming service called GeForce Now. Um, so uh, as a consumer marketing manager, I basically am responsible, I'm the client now, is the easiest way to explain it. So I would bring, I'd be the one that says, okay, here's my strategy, here's my brand objective, and if there's a problem that my team can't solve, I'm gonna go bring in the agency and say, okay, I need your guys' help with this email campaign, or I need your guys' help with this website. Um, but now I'm in the position of, of the client um, and executing these full go-to-market strategies for the two products that I run, this one being the NVIDIA Shield TV, um, and the second one being GeForce Now. I wish I could talk more about GeForce Now, I can't, but we'll talk basically about the whole process of bringing the Shield TV to market, which was really neat and exciting. Another diagram that I put together, I had a lot of fun with diagrams. Um, this is the, again, it's flow of information, it's not in order of importance, but this is really how it works at an in-house agency. Instead of everything coming down from a client, um, when you're in-house, the flow of information between the teams at the company is all kind of on the same playing field. So it starts with the product marketing team, which you see over on the left, and they're the ones that actually develop the product. So there's these guys that I sit next to that basically developed this thing, right? And they'll give me product demos as the marketing as the marketing lead for this product. They'll give me product demos and say, this is how it works, this is what it does, you know, plug it into your TV, take one home, now go, go sell it, go bring it to people, go market it. So I have to really understand this product like to the core to be able to develop a strategy about how I want to then bring it to market. So that's my role. And the marketing team, which is responsible for the marketing strategy, it consists of a ton of people. There's a social media um, community manager, there's still a product manager, there's, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of people that are on this marketing team, but one specific marketing lead responsible for the strategy, and that's what I do. Um, our creative team, who also is at NVIDIA, so again, everybody here is at NVIDIA. Our creative team, once we figure out the strategy, we'll take it to the creative team and say, okay, so here's the product, Here's how it works. Here's how I think we should sell it. Um, when I'm developing a strategy, I'm doing a lot of like looking at insights of what consumers use, what other streaming media players are out there in the market. How is Apple selling its Apple TV? What messaging are they using? What about Roku? Um, what about Amazon Fire TV? Like basically doing a lot of different competitive analysis to pull together a strategy that I think is going to work for us, knowing our product, and take those insights to the creative team. The creative team then. Same thing as an agency, but everybody's doing it within the same company now, is gonna say, okay, here's how I think this should look. Here's how I think the box should look. Here's, you know, here's what I think our website should look like. And everybody's ideating together at the same time. Um, and then we have our digital man management team, also in-house, that then basically takes everything, they develop our website, they develop our emails, um, and gets them out the door. So everything is done within NVIDIA. Back to what I kind of said originally, if there is something that we can't solve or we need help with, we'll bring in an agency to then help us with. Yeah. Uh, 
That's a great question. That's a really good question. A ton, definitely. Yeah, um, I think creative and the consumer marketing teams work very, very closely together because our creative team has expertise about what works and what doesn't on a website. So I can sit there all day and be like, okay, I think, you know, I think it should look like this. I think we should have this at the top and this message here and all these, you know, graphics at the bottom. And our creative team's gonna say, no, you want graphics at the top. Everything that's important, you want above the fold. So the creative team is absolutely involved in those strategy sessions for sure. Um, and we do try to involve them throughout the process the entire time for that exact reason because they know what's worked and what hasn't. Yeah? How large are these teams? I think it would depend on the actual product or brand. Um, for the Shield TV, these teams were smaller. Um, there was probably, there's two on the marketing team. Um, there's two on the, or sorry, two on the product marketing team, two on consumer marketing, about four on creative and about four on digital management. Um, for GeForce Now, which is another product that I work on, which is a much larger um, scale, there's probably, mm, there's still one lead on each team, but there's probably like 15 to 20. So it kind of depends on the visibility of the product, um, the importance of it internally, um, just how much of it there is to actually get out the door, right? So it, it depends on, on really kind of what the product itself actually is. Yeah. Any other, any questions? These are great questions. Anything else? I hope that makes sense with how, how it all works. So basically, I think a good example of, for a reason that we brought in an agency with this product launch specifically um, was that we ran out of time to just take these product shots ourselves. So the actual shot of our two Shield devices, um, you'll see the other ones and I'll pass these around too. Um, this, the actual product shots here, we had to bring in an agency to take them. And so what we did was we actually took the Shield TV itself, shipped them to an agency, got on a call with them, gave them all the direction for you know how we wanted them to look and how we wanted the remote to stand and how we wanted the streamer to sit and all this stuff. Um, they took all the photos and sent them back to us. So that's kind of a good example of, you know we did all the strategy, we did all the stuff, and then as the client said, we have this one problem that we need you guys to do. And that agency on the other side, not only did they do the shots that we wanted, but then they ideated on their own. So going back to the agency side of things, they got this project to take some photos and said, well, maybe it would look good like this. And they gave us a couple other options that we probably wouldn't have come up with ourselves. And that was, that's really neat. So it's, it's fun to work with an agency when you're in-house as well. They do cross over, but that was, that's probably the most recent example I have of, of bringing an agency in um, while you're working on an in-house project. Don't freeze on me. Hold on. Well, we might be frozen. You oh my God, no. <laughs> I actually have it because I like now I'm really used to it. Yeah, I think it might be my own laptop. Should be a bummer. Yep. No, we're good. I won't even um, do a. Man, Can you just turn it all the way off? Yeah. Does that work? <laughs> well, I'll just turn it all the way off, and while it's rebooting, we'll see if this works. But basically what I was going to say next um, was a similar slide that I'd put together about working at an agency, and there's pros and cons of working in-house, too. Um, and I think the pros, if this turns back on, please, um, would be that you become really specialized in whatever product you're working on. So like I talked about in an agency, variety is huge, right? You get whatever clients kind of coming in the door, you're getting you know, pharmaceutical, you're getting tech, in my case, uh, NVIDIA. Um, I'm really only working on GeForce Now and Shield, so I know everything that you can possibly want to know about that product um, and everything, the entire strategy, I'm responsible for all of it. Um, that's the second point is that I am really close to the actual strategy itself. So instead of, again, having a client coming and bringing and saying, this is how we're bringing it to market and this is what we're doing, um, I'm the one that comes up with that strategy. Here we go. <coughs> and then gets to take it to the internal teams. <coughs> so if this decides to reboot, I'll pass around some of the projects that we, that we put together just so you guys can kind of see like everything that we did on. 
Hmm. I have a flash drive if there's another. I'm just going to unhook the, um, let's just see. Did it come back on? It looks like it was going to. Just for a second. You had a question? Yeah. How much does it cost to get those pictures from the agency? It all depends. It all depends exactly on what agency you're using, how many photos that you want, um, how you're laying them out, who you're using. There's so many different variables. Um, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind when you are hiring an agency and you're looking at cost, there's a joke that we all used to say at the agency, which is fast, wait, quick, cheap, and good. You can't have all three, right? And so every client wants something done really fast, and it it's still look good, and you can't have all three. Um, so basically, you kind of have to give it to you. you have a really good timeline, um, it's probably going to be cheaper, but it's not going to be as good. So it kind of depends on exactly what you're asking for. How many you need? A lot, of, a lot of more expensive than you think. I would I would say, but um, again, it depends. Here we go on exactly what you're looking for. Mm. For this one specifically, it would it would be a, oh yeah there we go yay we're back cool thanks sorry guys hopefully this works ten to fifteen thousand yeah and you have your go-to agencies we do yes mm -hmm. every in there we go okay sorry about that guys not sure what happened uh, yeah every in-house um, or every yeah every in-house marketing team typically does have their go-to agencies. Um, there's always the opportunity for um, for an agency to pitch for business and kind of come in and say, hey, we think we could do this. Like, we're really good at this. We're really specialized in this certain type of um, project or technology. Let us help you. But every um, in-house marketing team typically does have an agency that they go to when they need something turned around really quickly. Um, so before this all froze and broke, um, this is kind of what I was saying, that working in-house, you will know and understand products like really, really well. That's the biggest difference, I think, between in-house and agency is that um, your, your expertise is really specialized in whatever product that you're assigned to. Um, you own the budget, you own decisions, you own the strategy. Um, it's really up to you to then go ask for your creative team for help. To your point in the back, you are working with the creative team to develop those strategies and bring things to market. Um, but it's really something that you have ownership of versus just executing. Um, and you do, kind of again to your point in the back, have relationships with and easy access to all these different internal teams. Um, so working very closely with creative, working very closely with development, going back to the product team and I can easily say, hey, I don't understand how this one piece of this product works, so how can I describe it better to a consumer? I can just kind of, well in my case, swivel my chair around to Brian who sits right behind me and say, help, you know. And, and that's easy, you're not waiting for approvals, you're not waiting for some client to get back to you to answer questions. Um, things can move a lot faster in-house. I'm gonna have, oh, there we go, good, it's still working. Okay, so that's all the talking that I'm going to do about describing the differences between agency and in-house. Are there any other questions before I get into some work samples? No? Cool. So Havas, these are the four clients that I worked on while I was at um, Havas, which was the agency. Seagate at the very top, data storage management. management. Um, I did do stuff for Crestees, like I mentioned, in Bucked Wild, some of, some of those consumer brands. And then um, Genentech, Biomarin, and Novartis are all big pharmaceutical companies. Um, I chose to highlight Seagate just because I think it's the most fun. Um, a couple years ago, we did something called the Seagate Smooch Booth, and this was before Snapchat was a thing. This was before there were like filters, so take it with a grain of salt when I show you what we actually put together. Um, but after, uh, but basically the problem from the client was that they wanted more exposure for their external hard drives. And it was the holiday time of year. They wanted to sell more hard drives. And the holidays are a time when we take a lot of photos, right? And so we don't have storage on our phones. We don't have, um, we're, we're, running out of, we're running out of storage. And so it's a perfect time to push that you might need this external hard drive. So we created this campaign called the Seagate Holiday Smooch Booth. Um, which again has a Seagate branding down at the bottom. This is how it looked on an iPad and the whole idea behind the campaign was to send a, send a smooch and spread joy. So what we did, and you'll see kind of integrated throughout all of the creative, right in the middle there are the hard drives that we're trying to push, um, the product itself that we're trying to push from Seagate. So the idea here was to take a picture of yourself, you know, add in some fun little holiday like, you know, a mistletoe, reindeer ears, um, a Rudolph nose, anything like that. 
and then easily be able to send it, um, like send a little holiday e-card. So that was the whole idea was send a smooch, spread joy. It actually went pretty, pretty viral for this audience. Um, again, this was before like Snapchat and Instagram had all the filters that we have now. So this was pretty, pretty cutting edge at the time. Um, and it was really fun and it did a really good job of pushing the message of like, hey, you have, you know, it was fun, but it also was like, hey, you're taking all these photos, you need somewhere else to back them up, an external hard drive from Seagate is probably the perfect place for you guys to do that. So this was one of my favorite campaigns that we worked on. A second one would be the Seagate Creating Space campaign and we totally globally relaunched the entire Seagate brand. So this is a great example of seeing a campaign that's gone like in every execution, the full digital and traditional um, route. So this itself was the campaign um, and the logo at the bottom was called the living logo. So what they wanted to really push here was that all data, the data, data is everything is really the idea that they wanted to push. So this logo when it was in an animated form actually moved and did all this cool stuff and we had all these different pictures of everything, of you know, windmills, of cars, of whatever, that would then move into this logo to show that everything is data and it's constantly being moved and needed to be stored. This is the, tra the train wrap that I talked about earlier. So this is what it actually looked like when we wrapped Caltrain. So again, to see, like to build this in, how, or in the agency and then to see it on the side of a train was really, really neat. So that was up for about two months um, in Santa Clara. This was the ad that we did in the New York, no, this is Wall Street Journal. We did Wall Street Journal and New York Times. So the whole right hand side was, um, was an ad that we designed, um, our creative team designed. And I think this was actually really beautiful. It looked phenomenal in person. I wish I had one, I don't. Um, but again, the whole campaign was space for, I mean, everything is data, so there's space for everything. So space for every article you ever read, space for every train trip you're gonna take, space for every whatever it was, it was a really flexible campaign that allowed us to do a lot of executions. This was really, really neat. Um, this was, so on the top left, we basically had, an, I think there were 50 airports around the country and that data is actually accurate. So at O'Hare, they were actually experiencing two hour delays that day. So we took the logo and then the words would kind of again flow into that living logo. So exposure everywhere. This was a really, this is a really like high level, like high um, exposure campaign. Budget to your point was, there was a lot of budget for this one. It was a global relaunch of a brand. So in this case, we have a lot more flexibility with what we can do. And this is what I'm talking about when I say, this is like the fun. We had TV commercials, radio spots, like everything. This was Times Square, um, and we basically took the, the Wall Street ticker and had all of the information, like all of the numbers and stuff, swivel into that logo. So this was super fun to work on. And this is what it looked like on the website. So a couple of different executions of how we brought that to life. NVIDIA. Um, so I talked a little bit about this, the NVIDIA Shield TV launch. This product itself launched, yeah. Two million. Mm -hmm. And you have access to like post launch analysis on the yes. ROI of that? Yeah, I don't have it with me now. Um, but yes, we always do a full for every campaign that we ever run, we do a full post post launch analysis. Um, is it hitting our main KPIs? Whatever they will be, every project that you'll ever work on in house or at an agency, there's gonna be specific KPIs um, that are that are tied to that project. So what's essentially when I say KPI, it's what's the goal of the project? Is it to get people to visit the website? Is it to actually sell this product? Is it um, for people to sign up to receive emails? Whatever it is, there's going to be a goal. There could be goals um, assigned to that specific project and the client's always gonna wanna know that their money is is working, right? So so yes, we always, I don't have them for this specific project with me, but there, there always is an analysis that happens that says, hey, you know, we've performed well, or we need to test and maybe do a little bit better, our emails aren't being opened, should we change the subject line, things like that, to make sure that we're optimizing and keeping things fresh. Cool. Um, so Shield TV launch, like I mentioned, um, this is how it started. So I have this photo, this is one of our first, again to your point in the back, this was creative saying, this was me and creative in a room saying, this is how I think the website should look, right? And we had all these different squares and we had all these different um, ideas and Shield TV can be at the top and it's transform your TV. And they came in and said, no, no, it should look like this. Super simple. So it went from this to this. And here, hopefully I don't break my computer again. 
we'll try and see if this comes up. Uh, maybe, hold on. This is the actual live website that we launched as a team in October. So, <coughs> this is, if it loads, I know it's a little slow in here. But basically, all those boxes that you saw that we, I don't think that images are loading quickly enough. But basically, all the boxes that you saw that we drew um, on this whiteboard really became that full website, which is pretty neat. Um, the boxes, this was actually really cool. So this was the full, the boxes that you're passing around are actually prototypes. They're not the boxes that are sold in store. Um, I was involved in every single creative review of the boxes and it got down to this level. So I have this spec sheet um, and you won't think there's a difference, but every single one of these is a different shade of black. And so we sat for two hours trying to figure out which black was going to be the best black for the printing of the black on the box. So again, I mean, I, I thought when I graduated I might not see one of these again, and I see them all the time. Um, picking the shades of black for a box that's going to be marketed to our consumer. So it's really neat um, to be involved, and if you guys want to pass, I know I'm getting close to out of time here, but that's a cool thing to kind of look at too. Um, and then again, to just see your products actually on sale. So this is a screenshot. I had the original link up, um, won't load, but from Amazon, like to see all the copy that we wrote, all the strategy that we put together to get this out to market, to see it live um, and for sale is, is really, really cool. Um, so to wrap it up, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons to both. I hope I made that clear kind of with um, what it's like working at an agency and what it's like working in house. Um, at an agency, variety is probably the biggest differentiating factor. Lots of clients, um, lots of projects, different business areas. Um, it's fast paced, it's cutting edge creative. I never thought I'd be doing a, an ad that would show up in, you know, in the Times Square, Wall Street, um, ticker or whatever it's called, but, but I did and that's so cool. But at, um, at NVIDIA, it's super specialized. I can tell you everything that you need to know about this Shield TV. Um, I get insight and access into all the teams. I'm very close to the development team, the creative team, things move quickly, um, but it's predictable because I have control over the process. So. That's really the biggest differences between the two. Um, I've loved, loved, loved both of them. The experience that I got at the agency has helped me tremendously with um, the role that I have currently in-house. Um, so wouldn't trade the way that I, that I took my path for, for anything. Um, so that's about it. Thank you guys for listening to me. I, I know I went a little bit longer than I intended, but yeah, you see my little note there on the bottom. Come talk to me if you guys are looking for an internship. My team is hiring. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. I like working with people. Um, I love creative, so I've always wanted to be close to creative, and the roles that I've had have allowed me to do that. Um, but I like being with working with partners. I like. Um, I, I think I just to me, it's it's working with people. So being an account director gave me access to working with clients. Um, being on the marketing side, not the creative side, at Nvidia again kind of gets me access to like working with all the different teams and working with partners and, and agencies and things like that. So I like a little more personally external exposure um, versus just doing the creative, but that's that's just me. Yeah. So when you were with the agency, hmm? um, Seagate made you the agency, their agency of record? Correct. Could you explain what that term means? Yeah. Sure, definitely. So agency of record means that, so if you're an agency of record for a client, any project that that client has, that agency of record is going to get. So if I am Seagate and Havas is our agency of record, anything that Seagate needs to do, Havas will be the number one choice. If a client does not, so NVIDIA, for example, does not have an agency of record. So if we need something done, we can go to whatever agency we think is going to specializes in whatever thing we need to get done. Um, most companies have an agency of record that they go to because that agency of record knows the brand. There's no ramp up time. They know the messaging. They have things like they have the images in like like in their repository. Everything's kind of ready to go so they can turn a little quicker. Um, so for Seagate, yes, we were the agency of record. So that's why they chose us to the full the full global rebrand. And when you 
The annual agency record budget, I don't remember, was definitely more than two million. Two million was only for that rebranding campaign. Yeah. Yeah. How much does it cost to wrap up a train with graphics? Oh my gosh. I don't, oh my God, I don't remember. A lot. Prices are, uh, they, they were higher, a lot higher than I remember. Oh, or a lot, uh, not remember, than I expected. And how was it done? Was it done with Scotch Cow and taken off, or is it painted? It was not painted. It was a wrap. So it was like shrink wrap is probably the easiest way to explain it. I remember it being like a, a shrink wrapped piece. I wasn't there when they actually did it, and I really wish I could have been, because I, like, I have this vision in my head of how they actually wrapped it. Um, and, and it's like a hard boiled egg on Easter when you're shrink wrapping it. Um, but no, it wasn't painted. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, I have, um, I do work on GeForce Now, which is a brand that's at NVIDIA. It's big gaming, if anybody's PC gamer. I know that whole world, I'm just not, can't talk about it yet. We're still in beta, but my team was really excited that we were here. So I have some gift cards um, to Steam, if anybody knows what that is, that I'd love to pass out. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you guys listening to me ramble and share my experience. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. So nice, of course. Thank you, thank you.